I'll start the uh, beginning. Cycling Magazine Show. Well, hello everybody. This is Jim Lawyer here with the Ultra Cycling Magazine Show, the show about all things ultra cycling. Hey Lee, hey Georgie, how are we doing today? Hey guys, I'm well, thank you. You stuck with me again for another weekend. Hey, not stuck. We appreciate you being here as a great yeah. guest host. You, you help us out a great deal, believe it or not. Definitely. Yeah. And we're here because of the folks who run the wonderful time stations here in Ohio. Time station uh, 41 in Oxford, Ohio. Time station 42 in Blanchester. And time station 43 in Oxford here on the race across America. And um, we want to make sure. Oh, yeah, we forgot about um, sign Mike guy. Yep. His signs. Yeah, great thing to have for a souvenir place to collect autographs for your trophy wall. Ten bucks at one of our time stations. You get a sign. Mike gets to put one on the road. Definitely. So, yeah. And um, we want to be sure that you are following us on Facebook and that you're subscribing to us on YouTube. And when you subscribe to us on YouTube, be sure to ring that bell to get notifications. Excellent. I think I think we got the bell ringer corralled there a little bit, Jim. So I think so. To, yeah, doesn't definitely keep, doesn't go off board. Doesn't keep ringing. <laughs> exactly. Well, E, I think we've got some updates coming for today. On uh, we'll go start with a couple of things Ultra Cycling Magazine show related. We're going to be at the Adventure Summit at Wright State. February 9th and 10th, uh, with all the info about our show, uh, Ram, Race Across the East, probably Wuka, and Spiegel and Infinity Seats. So come on out and join us out there. We'll be there, and glad to have you out there and talk. Yeah, well, Dayton, Ohio, or the Mima Valley here, is one of the centers for trail activity mm -hmm. in the nation. Crossroads of bikeways, crossroads for the National Hiking Trail. So um, there's the a lot center of, of it all. Around. Yep, center definitely. of it all, and we're going to try to be present there. Or our gym is. I I yep. might get over there. Who knows? You will get over there. I guarantee it, Lee. Okay. You miss it. <laughs> all <laughs> right. And uh, today we had a great Ram Crew seminar. Uh, I would very highly suggest if you are racing Ram, or race across the West, or race across the East, you attend the next one, which is in February. 17th and 18th uh if you click the qr code or scan the qr code or look at the show notes we will have the uh links there uh join up and you learn a lot of information even if you've done it in the past i would recommend joining this time because the they talk about the changes to the finish line since it's moved so uh definitely check that out guys okay and uh Let's see. Yeah, uh, you want to start that ticker so we can get. Yes, I will definitely. Comments and questions in here. If you got a comment or question on Facebook or YouTube, be sure to put it in the comment section, um, and uh, we'll get it up there as soon as we can. And hello to you, Dragon. We're glad, glad to have you here with us as well. Um. Well, it's uh, Cold Country Robay is in the works here, and we do have a little video, Jim. Okay. From, uh, the uh, Sapers down in Jacksonville, 
uh, North Carolina who are going to come up here and do coal country. All right. You want me to start that or? Go ahead. Start it. All right. I'm Allison Siepker. I'm registered for the coal country Bay. I'm really looking forward to meeting Joe in person and going up there and riding gravel and supporting his race. Um, I've known Joe for a while on Facebook and he's really inspiring and I'm, I'm really looking forward to supporting what he's doing. My name is Jeff Siepker. I'm registered for the Coal Country Roubaix. Uh, I'm excited to meet Joe in person. I'm a retired Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant. Uh, I've known Joe on Facebook for a little while. Um, excited to ride in Ohio. I've never been there before. It's going to be great. Excellent. And um, on our uh, show notes, which you can find at ucm.bike, um, you can see there my name tag there at the, our address for the website. In the show notes for this show, you'll see a link to uh, all of these uh, races that we've been talking about. Now, uh, a couple of news items. Uh, last week, we had the uh, uh, team for uh, disabled American veterans. Uh, the news is that they have linked up with Love, Sweat, and Gears, the uh, nonprofit that tries to field a team every year. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing, and uh, that'll be a big help to them, and we're happy to hear about that. Uh, also, uh, more news, da 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 da, -da. <laughs> um, and that is maybe, maybe, well, maybe I shouldn't say maybe. No, it will, yeah. but just Calvin's when. Challenge. Yes will come back in 2024, thanks to Larry Osland, who is also bringing back... <clears throat> Sebring. Uh, Sebring. Yes. So a uh, lot of new things happening here. Um, and um, so uh, we're happy to be able to tell you that uh, we'll see yeah. Calvin Challenge again. I've been chatting with Larry a little bit about yeah. that. And uh, we're looking forward to have that back here in the uh, Miami Valley area. Definitely. And we'll, we'll have a presence at both. So we, we will, will be, be there reporting. in yes. lock, stock, and barrel. Definitely. Um, next week, uh, we're going to Denmark with uh, Dee Dee Freeze. I hope I spelled her, you find that pronounced her name right. But uh, we'll try to get that. She is going to be racing solo in uh, Ram this year, Race Across America. Uh, she was going to be in a team about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. We had the team on uh, the Valkyries, but she couldn't make the team because she was diagnosed with cancer and was in chemotherapy. She has uh, triumphed over that and is coming back as a solo writer this year. She has a remarkable story to tell, a remarkable story of overcoming, and uh, we're going to be happy to feature her on next week's show along mm -hmm. with her charity for which she's raising money have we missed anything uh, yeah i i overlooked the uh, race across the east uh updates but there really isn't any from last week on counts but we are in the standard registration period so and we're about half full we've got a cap on the number of riders racers that we have this year so if you're going to ride it please go out there and register so we get get that filled up and again, in the show notes, like we mentioned before, you'll see a link where you can uh, find out more about the Race Across the East. Definitely. And also to register. Yes. Well, uh, we're happy to have uh, Christoph Strasser with us. We were chatting before we went on the air. Vic Armillo and uh, I was negotiating with Christoph uh, a couple of years ago. I was in the hospital and not feeling too good. But then the, the pandemic struck and everything kind of fell apart and we just never got back together. So we're just happy to have Christoph back with us again. Definitely. Christoph. Welcome to, uh, well, now the Ultra Cycling Magazine. I almost said the wrong thing. Uh-oh, you know? Lee. You'd have to put a dollar in the jar. <laughs> uh, put the dollar in the jar. Uh, and we're happy, of course, to have Georgie. Yes, definitely. Host it for us. So yes. Jim and I can relax. Yeah. Thank you both for being here. Definitely. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Hey, Crystal. 
You're on, Georgie. All right. Uh, I'm really excited, Christoph. Uh, first of all, uh, you started uh, now supported the uh, ultra cycling recently, so it's been it's been a blessing to follow you. But I mean, we don't just have any uh, ultra cyclists here, uh, so let's uh, give them the proper presentation. But this is the only man to win Ryan six times, Hall of Fame, uh, race cross Austria twice, the first man to go over a thousand kilometers in 24 hours on his training ride in preparation for the 1000k record and beating another <laughs> 11 records uh, world records in the process uh, the fastest crossing and uh during ram and uh, push to sydney the first man to go under seven days if i'm not mistaken so it's a pleasure to have you here today yeah it's great uh, as lee has told us it took quite some some time uh but now finally it's it's working out and uh, i'm looking forward to um, to talking to you thank you thank you how's been uh, the off season for you is something that i think is really important and a lot of us ultra cyclists uh, underestimate but uh, a lot of us end up burning out tell us how important uh, off season is i think it's uh, one of the most important parts uh, from the year because uh, you need to regain your your strength and your motivation as well so I think uh, the physical recovery um, could be much faster, but I did five weeks without any bike ride at all. I was in New Zealand. I did a lot of uh, walking, hiking, kayaking, and just relaxing and enjoying uh, holidays and having a good time. And after that, I had a lot of motivation again to start training. And I think... Yeah, that's that's the thing when people underestimate to take some time off because uh, during the year you're thinking about your training, about your plannings, about your preparation, about the races all the time and it kind of makes you tired in your mind. So yeah, I'm really a big fan of, of leaving the bike for a few weeks at home and, and just do something else. Yeah, and, and uh, the key word recovery and motivation because... Uh, I know ultra cycling is very demanding on, on the body and uh, sometimes you have injuries. So uh, this is really impressive. And how do you find even motivation? Why ultra cycling? It's not something, it's not something that the regular cyclists even do. Why long distance cycling? Um, I think it's something completely different compared to uh, like pro tour or world tour cycling and stage racing. But... Uh, yeah, I just love it. And uh, in the in the last years, everything was working so fine, and I'm really able to make a living from cycling, not by being a sponsored rider, but uh, I'm doing keynotes and talks, and I have a, a German uh, language uh, podcast. I have an online stop for sports stuff and cycling stuff. So all of that is 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 able for me to to. I made my hobby as to my profession and I really enjoy that and I would be very stupid if I if I leave cycling now so yeah I'm really grateful for everything and and I think if you don't like what you do uh, you will never do it very good and I still enjoy cycling very much even if I'm cycling for half of my life I love it and well deserved too um one question about about Ram. Uh, I know we're going to talk about the transcontinental, but uh, we have to ask a few of those questions. <laughs> so the, the the finish line changed this year to New Jersey. First of all, obviously, what do you think about it? And uh, do you think uh, sub uh, sub eight days is possible with the new finish line? Um, I think there are some more route changes, so the distance will be quite similar to the last years, as mm -hmm. I as far as I know. Um, but I'm not sure because I always have been finishing when I reached the finish line in my nine participations. I, I reached the finish line seven times. Uh, two times I had to, to DNF and I was stopping in, in Kansas both times. Um, the finish line was always uh, in Maryland, so in Annapolis. And I cannot really compare it with the new course. But I think uh, getting a new route is definitely good for, for the motivation of, of people who are doing RAM several times because mm -hmm. I think the good thing about having the same route every year is 
you really get to know it you you know what is where is the difficult part where is the easy part what is a good time to take a sleeping break uh, where is i don't know you just know everything about it you can really go in the details of planning if you have the same route but when you have a new route it will be more exciting more adventurous and i think it's good to change the route sometimes and I guess everything else have to go well too. It's not just the route, but I mean the weather have to be on your on your side, your equipment, the crew. So it's the whole package. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, unsupported uh, racing, which you started two years ago uh, during Transcontinental. Uh, tell us first why you chose this race and why did you choose to even switch to unsupported racing? Maybe curiosity. Let's see if this is something. Uh, um... you can Yes, of course, it was curiosity. And honestly, I did RAM nine times. And um, when I when I did my first RAM, I was never dreaming of, of being like there so often and, and winning the race so often. It was just a big dream coming true. But after 2019, which was my, my last race across America until now, I was looking for some new motivation because I thought I need to try a new challenge. Um, and then I did the 24 hour record. I was training a whole year just for that one day. A whole year of training was focused and planned to be able uh, to ride a thousand kilometers or a bit more. Um, I wasn't really expecting to achieve it on the first attempt. But I was really riding strong and, and I, was, I didn't have any bad luck, just a little bit of rain. But generally, the weather was good. It wasn't too hot in the summer. And when I, when I was like reaching the 1000 case, I thought I, I was looking for another challenge in ultra cycling. And in the years before, I was thinking I will never do unsupported racing. I'm sure I will never do it because I thought it is it is maybe more dangerous because the support crew is here to protect you mm -hmm. and to help you. And when you are like really tired and, and sleep deprived during the night, uh, you can maybe have a crash or in the traffic, it's, it's getting tough. Maybe um, you are losing your way. You have problems with navigation. You don't you're not able to buy food or drink so you're getting like you're bonking you are like suffering much more um and i also thought that maybe it's not really a race to go unsupported it's more an adventure and i really like racing very much i'm very competitive i enjoy having strong competitors um but then i realized that because i was following very closely i was reading watching movies, listening to podcasts from unsupported uh, racers. And I thought to myself, um, I think the level of competition also raised in unsupported races. It was really, it has increased a lot. And then I thought to myself, maybe in 20 or 30 years in the future, I will regret maybe if I never tried it. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to do the transcontinental race because I think it has the it is the the best known unsupported race. It's really legendary. It, it has a, a strong reputation. And it also offers free route planning, which is an additional challenge. Yes, and after I was entering the race, while racing, I found out that the level of competition is so high and the, the, the riders are so fast and so strong. And I really had a lot of troubles uh, to keep it up with them, I was I was far behind on the first few days before before I really learned about the details and and found my rhythm and and stopped doing mistakes. Yeah, it's been very exciting to watch. You know, the first one was uh, TCR eight and twenty two, the one going from uh, again Belgium, Czech Republic, uh, Italy, Montenegro, Romania, Bulgaria, and it, it wasn't until the very last. Uh, uh, day that you took the lead uh, while crossing into Bulgaria, so that was that was pretty exciting. And I think you only won by eight hours. And uh, the third guy behind you was uh, what half a day ahead. Like, uh, and you know, in ultra cycling, those uh, this much is not is nothing decisive. So um, 
in TCR9 though 2023, um, you learn, I guess, a bit from your first time. I know you didn't have the uh, experience on your end, but uh, obviously, even even without it and making mistakes in the first TCR, you won. The second one, it seems like you were way more prepared, uh, not physically, but uh, all the rest of it. Uh, and the second one, if not mistaken, it was shorter, but it was a lot, a lot more climbing, right? And you did mention you That's have true. to plan your own route. So I figured because you like flats, you decided to go for, for flats. Uh, there are some really bad sections there in the parkour. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, uh, regarding the rules, um, in transcontinental race, you have uh, three routes between the checkpoints, but there are only four checkpoints and the distance is about 3,500 kilometers to 4,500, something like that. So the, the distance between checkpoints is about 1,000 K. And uh, next to the checkpoints, you have a short parkour, which is a mandatory route. So everybody has to take the parkour. Um, and it's never between, easy. You know, it's, <laughs> they are never easy. Sometimes they are off-road with gravel sections and really tough and difficult and also frustrating. Uh, but between these parkours, you can you can create your own route, and it is a lot of work, a lot of planning. You have to check uh, different planning tools like Google Maps and Strava and Ride with GPS and Komoot and Google Street View and Google Satellite Pictures. Uh, you have to try to find out all the information, and you can make make the choice. Um, you can go over the mountain with more climbing and and shorter route. You can go around the mountain, take a, a detour, but it's flatter. And of course, everybody knows that I am enjoying flats and fast roads uh, with less climbing. So I, I often took a detour. And yeah, um, my first TCR was really, I think, the closest and, and most exciting one in history because after 4,000 kilometers, the three leaders have been within just one hour. So it was really three people on the front of the race, uh, head to head. It was really, really exciting. And uh, yeah, I was, I was lucky and I was strong in the end. And, and so I, I, could, I could take uh, the win in my first race. And I think what, what really helped me was my, my experience from, from Race Across America and all the other races, because of course it's something completely different it's hard to compare supported and unsupported racing. Um, but of course, I think physically I was a bit stronger maybe, and I didn't suffer as much as, as the other ones in the beginning, because I'm used to ride uh, for eight days in a row. And I was really bad in self-organization and, and the logistics and the technique, uh, because you need to, to fix your bike on yourself. You need, um, you must try not to waste time when you when you are going to a to a gas station shop to buy food and drinks. You you shouldn't waste time when you take a sleep break for two or three hours. And I wasn't really good in these terms in the beginning, but I was learning during the race. And in my second race, um, yeah, I had much more experience in unsupported racing, and it was quite. Uh, I was quite in a good flow from the beginning on. I didn't, I did nearly no mistakes. I was like saving some energy for the second part of the race. And since uh, Robin, who was head to head with me for more than half of the race, um, yeah, I think in the end I was, I don't know, it was really tough. And, and in the end I was little bit stronger but it was very close and he always took took some adventurous routes short ones with off-road sections i took the long routes um on the road so sometimes he was nearly catching me again because he had a a better route and and he he took some risk in the mountains uh so i think it was really exciting to watch yeah definitely Usually we see you at Ram start start fast, take the lead on day one and never give it back. Uh, you must have answered this before, but you know, do you like chasing or being chased? One puts more pressure on you. Uh, this year was the same at Transcontinental. You finished, uh, you made it to CP1 in, Italy, in the Italian Alps, 14 
Robin made it 14 minutes faster than you, so you weren't in the lead after over a day of racing. Um, yeah, it's it's again it's completely different because in in Ram I know that I can I have a strong support crew and my 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 support team is really great and they are experienced and they are making no mistakes and so I can really push myself to the limit uh, because I know I have good nutrition I have good logistics. I don't need to, to care about anything, just pushing, pushing, pushing. So it is possible to exhaust yourself really to the limit in Race Across America. Uh, but in unsupported racing, it's it's really a big mistake if you push too hard. So because you need to stay clear in your mind, you you must sleep more because if you are too tired, you're making mistakes. So you always must stay on the safe side. and. You have poor nutrition, really. There is no high quality food uh, along the route when you go to supermarkets or gas stations. So you are not able to dig deep like you can do in RAM. And I always try to avoid risk. I'm, I always prefer to stay on the safe side. So this is why in unsupported racing, I have a different strategy. Yeah. yeah. I'm starting slower, definitely. Yeah, I've noticed that. And, uh... I, you mentioned sleeping. That's a big, big part of it. It seems like you slept. Uh, well, at least you were off the bike for roughly four hours a day. But uh, for people to understand, that's not four hours of sleeping. I'm assuming because you have to undress and dress and prepare and check in hotel if you're in hotel. But you actually end up using more hotels this year than last year, right? Because of the bad weather, and that possibly helped you with recovery. Yes. Yes, I think there is always two opinions from from people in unsupported racing. Uh, a lot of people like to sleep outdoors with just your sleeping bag, and you can you can lay down anywhere you want, where, where you have find a, a safe spot, and maybe with a roof or something like a bus station or I don't know, just just anywhere where you can stay dry in the night and shelter of wind or something, but. In reality, you you cannot make a plan where you go to sleep. So you must look for a suitable spot. And that also takes time. And the rules of unsupported racing say that um, it is allowed to use public uh, services like supermarkets, bike shops and hotels or uh, yeah, small hotels. So it's not allowed to use private support, but public available support is okay and in my first race i was sleeping outdoors for one night and in a room on the next night and then outdoor again and in the room again and in the in my second race i was sleeping in rooms always um and i think maybe sleeping outdoors is more romantic you know uh it's like the the fairy tale you're sleeping under the sky you see the you see the stars and, and you're sleeping outdoors and it's really like a great experience. But in terms of efficiency, I think being in a room is better because you're not freezing. It is dry. You are really much faster. You can take a shower. And when you get up in the morning after, in my case, it was about two and a half to three hours of sleep, um, you're just ready to go. You get up, get your dress and go. And when you're outdoors, you have to pack your sleeping bag and your fingers are cold and you are slow and everything is wet. And it's really, it takes more time to, to get going. And during the day, after sleeping in the room, I was, I was in better shape mentally than when I slept outdoors. Because after an outdoor sleep, I got very tired again in the middle of the day. And I think recovery is better when you're sleeping in a bed. Yeah, agreed. And it seems like you use similar strategy as many racers going to bed around 12 midnight to one in the morning, maybe to avoid a little bit of the, the night riding and just go keep going until after darkness. But uh, yeah, it was fascinating to watch. Um, so there were strong racers like you mentioned. I think this year you won by six hours and we said the year before by eight, but even even the third guy, he was uh, 
16, 17 hours behind you, which is nothing in ultra cycling. I mean, racer like Robert Mueller, uh, he wasn't in the top three, but he was three hours faster than, than, than you to CP2. He had a rough, rough start to CP1, but I think Adam, obviously the year before, Pavel and Uri, who won, I think, Tour Divide and many other unsupported races. But I, I agree with you. I think if these guys uh, show up to a race like Cram, they will give a lot of uh, a lot of racers a hard time. Uh, it was it was fascinating to watch. Um, yeah, but but just just let me say one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I I know Ulrich very good, and he he said that uh, he couldn't imagine doing a race with a crew. And I think it's really, it's really a big difference because you have to make, you have to build a crew. You don't get a, a crew uh, like a Christmas present, or no sponsor can give you a crew, but you have to build it. The crew has to grow with you, and it's a long time process to really have a good crew in in Ram. Everybody of the people in the crew should have some experience, so it's like a long term thing to have an experienced crew. So a strong rider alone. Um, Will also have struggles in RAM, getting used to the to his to, to the to the routine within the race. But of course, physically and mentally, they are on a great level. But in terms of having an experienced crew, they have to to put some time in. Totally different type of racing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, by CP3, I think uh, you had a five five hour lead. It seems like you, you picked up the pace there, uh, 14 on 14 hours on the third and, and five hours on, on Rob. And do you remember what changed there? Although the routes that you guys take are different, so it's kind of subjective, but uh, it seems like you started picking up the pace there. Yes, um, I think it paid off to sleep more in the beginning of the race. So I was I really had some energy left in the second half of the race. And also because I was avoiding risk, um, I lost some time maybe here and there. Robin was a little bit faster because he took the the adventurous route and the short route. But in Bosnia, he had after two thirds of the distance, he had um, his tire damaged. So he had to stop, find the bike shop, get a new tire. Uh, it, he was on a tubeless system. I was on tubes, which is... I mean, tubes are old school in the meantime, but I still prefer them because they're easy to change and easy to fix. Um, he was on tubeless, so he lost, I think, about two hours um, to get his bike uh, fixed and his new tire. So you always have to think when you take the adventurous route, maybe you're damaging your bike or, I don't know, have some, some consequences later in the race. And I think the, he had some bad luck, which I did not have. And also, my strategy was to, to sleep enough in the first half of the race and then reduce the sleep by the end. So if I feel strong on the last two days, um, I have some, yeah, some reserve uh, in my tank and then I can reduce the sleep by the end of the race. Yeah, and I think this is from the... The section from Albania to Greece. I think you had two, two nasty uh, parkours there, if I'm remembering, or this is the the very last one. But and you mentioned tires. I think you did it on a 28 uh, millimeter tires. Yes. I wonder what you think about that. It's always a, a hot topic. It, there's some really bad stretches, but the rest is fine. So what would you choose if you do it again? I think I will. I would stay with the same tires because even if the parkour and the gravel sections are really, really frustrating and, and tough for, for your body and your bike, um, I mean, like 97% of the distance is on tarmac, you know? So if you take a big tire, an off-road tire, you will have a better time maybe on the, on the off-road section, but you will be much slower on the road. So you have to make like... Yeah, you have to weigh it up and make a calculation. Um, I think it's faster to have a, a, a fast tire and on the parkour, maybe a bit more suffering, but parkours are short. So the amount of time lost is, is not that big. And also for, um, I have to say, safety, the safety topic. I was always afraid of 
of having like dangerous situations on the road uh, without a support crew, but actually you are the ma the one who decides if you are dangerous or not because you can take the big roads or the small roads. Um, you have a lot of lights uh, on on the bike, and in in the southeast Europe countries there is not as much traffic as here in 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 Austria, or Germany, or Italy, or France. So I really found out that also race across America can can be dangerous on on some sections, even if you have your support crew. So it always like depends on on your state of mind also. And that's why I don't like to sleep too little, because if you're sleeping too little, uh, you will be more uh, in dangerous situations than when you're like well focused. Yeah, agreed. Um, another topic you mentioned was uh, diet, food strategy. And for uh, unsupported, actually, is way different. I crossed the US once, and uh, there's stretches sometimes of 200 miles with no services. I imagine it's not the same in Europe, but you have these small countries in Eastern Europe. How do you find food there? I know it's not like in America, uh, gas stations open 24 seven and so on. So how did you manage that? Yeah, actually it was, it was quite easy to get, to get to small markets and, and stores, uh, in Southeast Europe. Um, it was, for example, nobody expects that France would be difficult to to, to get uh, eating and drinking, uh, but actually uh, shops are closing down during during middle of the day and they are closing down in the evening. And even if the Tour de France is, is the, the most popular bicycle race in the world, um, in France it's actually quite difficult to, to find nutrition and in Southeast Europe it, it wasn't that hard because there are no, no big supermarkets but there are a lot of small supermarkets and a lot of of small like farmers offering their product and and small um very small stores and yeah it's it's actually really enjoyable to ride in southeast europe much more than i was expecting oh wow very very interesting to hear um i heard you talk about buying a simple bread and making your own syrup i imagine you can find food but it's not the food you like so uh you know you're forced to kind of eat junk food I, I know that affects your performance so uh tell us a bit about uh, your diet if you can yeah that was i mean i was afraid of a lot of things i was afraid of getting lost of having no phone reception of like your energy of of the of the garmin and of the phone uh gets down and you have no chance to to charge I was afraid of dogs in Southeast Europe. I was afraid of, I don't know, damaging my bike and not able to repair it. Um, and I was afraid of getting sick because of bad quality food or of, I don't know, eating too little or drinking too little. But I was really thinking a lot about that and making some kind of strategy if possible. And of course, in the beginning, I had a lot of Coke and Snickers and all that stuff. I mean, you can you can finish a race with just a race with just junk food, but you will suffer a bit more. And especially after my first TCR, I really had a very bad and very slow recovery. It took me three months again uh, until I could get to serious training again. And so in my second race, I was planning on no sneakers and no Coke, but yeah, I had some electrolyte and carbohydrate powder um, in my in my bottles. I took some powder with me and in very high concentration, so just a little bit of water and a lot of powder. So it was like honey, it was very thick. And I could just use some water to that. And I was I had a really high quality drink for the first couple of days. And I was eating just plain bread because there is no, there are no chemicals in there and, and no bad stuff. And you can digest it very easily. And I was also eating a lot of fish. So a lot of smoked salmon for proteins. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Georgie, we've got some questions. Quite strange 
it's a quite strange day diet it didn't really taste good but it was working we have some questions we want to get to uh georgie um i want to put the well that's my question <laughs> but i i actually have another one uh okay. are you uh are you uh electronic shifting or cables for your offer for your uh, cross unsupported i am on electric yeah i prefer um, shimano to be honest um but i really enjoy the electric ones because one of the biggest problems if is getting numb fingers mm -hmm. um and yes in the case that you really have a bad mechanical problem maybe you are not able to repair the mechanical system. That's true. But in all my life, I never had one mechanical system breaking down. So it's a little bit of risk I take. I hope for the shifting okay. not to break. But there are a lot of good things about it. You, yes. Even if your fingers are numb, you can, you can shift easily. <laughs> you can ask my other question, Jim. Uh, do you plan your route pretty much ahead of time or do you make some real-time decisions on the route of course i am doing the planning before the race because it really takes a long time but i have always some different options you know sometimes i'm perfectly sure where i'm going and no matter what happens i will stay on this road but especially at the end of the race i have sometimes two or three options because maybe there is like the big fast road but i will only go there if there is little traffic mm -hmm. if it's in the in the rush hour i will take an option b taking a small detour on a smaller safe road gotcha. um, sometimes i also have two routes prepared just for case of weather situation so if it's like raining i will go around the mountain and if it's like <clears throat> great weather i can go over the mountain so during the race, I just have to choose between these two options, which I have prepared. Excellent. And uh, <clears throat> Ladian wanted to know about oh. uh, water supply. Okay, you want me to do that one next? Yeah. Water supply, um, actually quite easy. Um, there are a lo lots of um, possibilities to get your bottles refilled just with like a fountain or a dwell. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the vocabulary, but just water in the nature you find a lot of them and otherwise you go to a gas station but i never had i really never had a problem of of no water yeah do you carry a filter sorry yeah do you carry a filter or purification system with you yes i have okay. some some medicine for like getting sick and for mm -hmm. my stomach and for like headache or some some of, of these things and also some pills for like clearing the water yeah, yeah. gotcha and Dwayne Ball asks, when's your next RAM? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, honestly, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Sometimes I'm thinking of doing RAM again because, you know, I have been there nine times and 10 would be a good number. Right. Um, but on the other hand, um, I did it nine times. So I, I really need to have a good reason uh, to do it again. Uh, because it's it's a big effort, you know, yeah. also financially. Uh, yeah. it, it becomes expensive, especially if getting over there from Europe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think maybe I will do it again, maybe not. I just okay. can, cannot tell it at the moment. Would it, would it, if they offered an unsupported option for RAM in the future, would you jump on that? Um would be worth a thought yes okay and uh, what's next christoph what's yeah next what is you? yeah what is next um i'm really training hard at the moment i'm i have a lot of motivation for this upcoming season but i didn't make a final decision which race you know there is there are some options um here in in europe um I've just seen the question to be hard race, mm -hmm. uh, which is Bosnia. I really like that. I also like the race across Italy. I like transcontinental. Maybe I'll try to do it again. There is also a new race called Via uh, crossing Europe. 
Um, this is also interesting. Then there is the uh, North Cape Tarifa from the northern part of Europe to the most southern part of mm -hmm. Europe. And also the 24-hour races are still very interesting. So I have to make a final decision which race, but I will do again like two or three big races this year. Excellent. Yeah, it will be nice to see you again at Transcontinental. We have uh, the Belgian Christoph Allegar holding three wins. So if you win again, I know that this must motivate you. You, you will match his uh, his win. So. Yeah, that's, that's of course... Uh, an interesting thought and also it's the 10 year anniversary which is also a special thing and it, it the start is in Roubaix this year in the like holy place for cyclists one of the of the great places so yeah <laughs> let's see <laughs> it's, big. There, it's always big isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> talking is he talking about my hairstyle? My <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I had a haircut like two weeks ago. Otherwise, it would have been that long. So they there are just go. like... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was growing my hair when the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the, I don't know, the barbers were closed and I didn't want to cut the hair for a couple of months or it was two years. And then... Now it really breaks my heart to cut my hair off. I'd, I'd like it the way they are. And regarding comfort, it is actually quite, quite nice to have hair during the summer because when it's really hot and when the sun is shining bright, um, you can pour some water over your head. Yep. And when you have hair, it stays cool for a very long time. Mm -hmm. When <laughs> in, in Race Across America, I always was shaving my hair. Mm -hmm. And you pour water, and 30 seconds later, you're hot again. Yep. Excellent tip. <laughs> <laughs> For everybody who yes. is able to have long hair, you know. There you go. I'm, I'm 40 years now, so a lot of my friends, they, they would like to change their hairstyle with mine. Yes, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, I'm jealous, too. I tried drawing it, and it doesn't look as nice. <laughs> Any more questions out there, Lee? I think we got them all, haven't we, Jim? Oh, uh, yeah, we're all caught up. If anybody's got one, pop one in now. Yeah, because there's a little delay between the time you ask questions. I want to say a shout out to those who are watching on uh, Instagram. It seems to be working. Yes. Although uh, it doesn't, we haven't figured out a way to save it on Instagram. So if you want to see the <laughs> rerun, you'll have to go to either YouTube or. Facebook. Facebook, I guess, yes, Jim. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Right now. We'll get that solved, though. We'll, we'll try, anyhow. Thanks, Dusty. Here's Dusty. Hey, our, our good friend, Dusty. Always glad to see you. Well, listen, we could go on and on here, but it's getting late in Austria, I know. And um, we want to thank you, Christoph, for being with us. We really enjoyed your chat. We just try to ha relax and have fun here. And I think you found that uh, spirit. Um, he wants, Vic wants to know if the race across the East interests you. Um, I read about the race across the East, of course, in the RAM newsletter and mm -hmm. on the website. And I think it's a great idea. I have been there for training uh, 10 years ago. I've mm -hmm. been... Um, taking a flight to Cincinnati mm -hmm. and from Cincinnati until Annapolis I was I think it was about one week or ten days I took like one stage after the other to get to know the Ram route uh, in the east for training and it was really much more enjoyable than in Ram because in Ram you were like tired and angry and, and <laughs> in some bad spirit sometimes uh, but when you're like clear in your mind and I was really able to enjoy that part of the route and I think it's it's a great idea to have race across the west and race across the east. Yes. Okay. Uh, looks, I believe we're caught up again. Yep, we're all caught yeah. up. Yep, definitely. Uh, we do want to thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you once again for being with us, Christoph. Yes. Thank you, Georgie, yeah. for uh, arranging this, helping us to arrange it. Yep. 
And great, yeah. great job, Georgie, by the way, on yeah, the interview. We, uh, yes, excellent. The, the check will be in the mail, Georgie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but don't look for it tomorrow. <laughs> um, and uh, with that, uh, Jim, I think uh, we're going to uh, thank everybody for watching. Thank you yes. for all your comments. Uh, I see a see comment. What, uh, yeah, that's what here. I'm going to get got right it? now. Yep, I got it right now. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Sabine. Hey, everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a great, uh, great show. Yes. And uh, we really appreciate Christoph. Uh, you're welcome back here anytime you've got something to, yes. to talk about. And anything you want to promote, we're here for you. Yeah, definitely. All right, Thank let me you. see if I can. Go ahead. Have a great, have a great evening. Uh, I have a great evening. You have a great day. Yes. <laughs> see All you right. soon. Okay. I'm going to find, I'm gonna find our, our outro gonna... man. Fine. This is Gregory Zuber thanking you for watching and sharing. Music by Kevin Cloud.